Hi, everyone, and welcome. I just want to start by thanking you for taking time out of your busy days to join us for this webinar on childhood bereavement and looking at Children's Grief Awareness Day and Children's Grief Awareness Month. Uh, I'm Evelyn Moon. I'm the Director of Learning and Content Strategy at Good Grief. I'm coming to you from our beautiful Princeton, New Jersey Center, and I support all things Good Grief schools at our organization, and part of my role is to run this community webinar series. This series runs every school year. It is offered at no cost to our Good Grief community. This session will be recorded and put on YouTube, so feel free to share. And those of you that have attended live will receive a follow-up email with all the resources from today, but also your certificate of attendance. Um, so we hope to see you at future sessions as well. We'll tell you about December's at the end of our hour together. Um, and thank you. So this is me. I am Evelyn Moon. My pronouns are she, her. As I said, I'm the Director of Learning and Content Strategy at Good Grief, and I have been working with social-emotional learning-focused programming for about a dozen years now. These are just some fun facts. I'm a mom to a nine-year-old child. I'm a product of New Jersey Public Schools K-12. through My super Jersey fun fact is that I am a third-generation Rutgers graduate on my mother's side. I did hop across the river from my master's at NYU, and I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Um, but now I'd like to um, introduce you to my co-presenter. Thank you, Evelyn. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Annette Mendez, and my pronouns are she and her. I am the training and curriculum manager here at Good Grief, um, and I've been working with educators and administrators delivering trainings on how to promote diversity, inclusion, and equity as well as social emotional learning programs. And some fun facts about me, I am the mom of three beautiful, beautiful future legends. I have a son who's 17, he's a senior in high school. So I cry a lot because <laughs> he's leaving me. Um, I have a nine-year-old who pretends she's a 17 year old. And I have a seven-year-old who the rules just don't apply to her at all. Um, but they're all legends in their own right. I am also a product of the New Jersey public school system. I was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, right now I'm a Morris County resident, but my background is, you know, in Newark. I am a first generation college graduate. I have my BA and master's certification from Montclair State. So go Red Hawks. Um, and I am a gigantic Mr. Rogers fan. Um, I always do this little plug. Uh, when I first started Good Grief, Evelyn um, explained Good Grief to us as if Brene Brown and Fred Rogers had a nonprofit cute little baby and that's good grief. So <laughs> um, I was sold at that point because I love, love Mr. Rogers. So that's a little bit about us um, since we'll be spending some time together and we'll have a moment to check in with all of you who are zooming in from home or from work or from wherever you are. Uh, but for those of you who might not be familiar with the organization we represent, uh, we are from an organization called Good Grief. We have been around in New Jersey since 2004, and our mission is to build resilience in children, strengthen families, and empower communities to grow from loss and adversity. So for most of our organization's history, we have been providing completely free and unlimited peer support programming to grieving children and families. We start at age three, and we go through young adulthood, so up to age 30 with our kids, and we do this in our centers. Uh, we have one in, let me pull up the picture for you all. We have our original in Morristown, um, and then we opened a second location in Princeton. We also do some virtual support for our young adults. We found that is a group that really is thriving in the virtual space. So a holdover from those COVID days, but I think one that's been really effective and impactful for them. So this is the work that we do. We do our family support services, which is our nights of support. We work with schools, we have uh, grief group curriculums, SEL curriculums, professional development for educators, but also for parents and caregivers. Uh, we do something called Grief Expression Summer Camp. This March, we will be returning to the Pingree School for our Good Grief Spring Institute. That is an event that is open to the public, our PD and training, and then community webinars uh, where you all are here and we're so glad um, that you are part of this community. Thanks, Evelyn. So I'm just going to read straight from the slide and uh, let you know what our topics are for today. We're really going to uh, reflect on Children's Grief Awareness Day and, and go into why it's important. We're going to explore some ideas that you can implement in your school or in your district to help raise awareness around children's grief. 
We're also gonna demonstrate an activity for grades K through five and six through 12. Um, we're gonna split that up between Evelyn and myself. Um, and then you can utilize that with your students and take it back to your schools. And we're also gonna look at ways that you can get involved um, and support grieving children and their families. But before we do all that, we're gonna do a quick uh, waterfall check-in, which is really, really cool. <laughs> so please make sure that your chat is set to everyone. Um, the next thing I want you to do is think of three words to describe how you are feeling right now. Um, and we're going to ask you to type that word in the chat, but wait, please, 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 <laughs> please wait until we say um, go, uh, because that way we'll have like this waterfall effect into the, into the chat. Okay. So are you ready? Get set and go. Think of three words to describe how you are feeling right now. Happy, stressed, and motivated. <laughs> Useful, inspired, and happy. Overwhelmed, sad, but hopeful. Yes, Deborah, I am also hungry. I think I'm always hungry. <laughs> Angry. <laughs> I love seeing that you guys are all motivated. That just, that's awesome. Calm and focused, content. Oh, Lori just ate. Excited. Tired, excited, and satisfied. Yes, I'm exhausted myself. And I'm so not looking forward to daylight savings times because it just, it helps no parent. <laughs> excited, happy, and hopeful. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Yes. That. that was a fun waterfall. It started, there was a little trickle and then yeah, there was the brush. And it. now we're still, we've still got some coming in. So if you want to share your three words, for how you're checking in, continue to utilize the chat. Thank you. Also, I love how you all are talking to each other. Too. <laughs> I, I was going to say that you took the words out of my mouth. I appreciate that so much. Um, so we want to talk about Children's Grief Awareness Day. And we thought, first, let's talk about what this day, what this month is. So Children's Grief Awareness Month is the entire month of November. So if you're on our social media channels, you'll see throughout the entire month, we'll be posting about it. We join the NACG's campaign called Flip the Script. So you will see us sharing um, some words that are straight from young people from a youth advisory board about children's grief. So um, please stay tuned and look out for some of that. But Children's Grief Awareness Day is always observed the third Thursday in November. So every year, this is the Thursday before the US holiday of Thanksgiving. And the mission of Children's Grief Awareness Day is to help grieving children feel less alone. We want to reduce that isolation. We want them to feel more supported because we want to change the culture and the conversation surrounding children and grief. And this change can happen by helping others to understand the impact of a death on children and their need for support. So this day began in 2008 as a result of kids. So that's something that I love about this. It was a collaboration between school children in Northwest Pennsylvania and Highmark the Caring Place. Shout out to them. They hosted the NACG Symposium um, this past June. So I got to tour one of their centers. It was wonderful. Um, and the students wanted to do more to bring what they had learned um, from their grieving classmates and what they had to cope with and what they wanted their peers to know. They wanted them to know that they're not alone. They're not forgotten. Um, out of these beginnings, this event grew. Uh, grief orgs across the nation um, recognize and honor and celebrate this day. So Good Grief is proud to be part of this movement. But I think there's also the why. So why is this important? Children have been referred to as the forgotten mourners. I think a lot of times we reduce children's grief or we're very uncomfortable with it and we don't know what to do with it. Yeah, we don't know how to talk to or be present for a child who is grieving. There was even a time when researchers thought that because children didn't understand the reality and permanence of death, that they weren't actually grieving. Now, we all know that that's not true. Um, and fortunately, this is changing. You know, Because of things like Children's Grief Awareness Month and Children's Grief Awareness Day and the advocacy of all these child grief orgs, you know, we want to ensure that no child is grieving alone and that we are changing the conversation around it. So this comes to us from judyshouse.org slash CBAM. Um, Annette, could you put that in the chat for 
folks. I'd appreciate that. So Judy's House every year does something called the Estimated Rates of Childhood Bereavement. And if you're a dad and nerd, you will love this website. They show national, state, and county levels of childhood bereavement. And they estimate that one in 12 young people will experience the death of a parent or sibling by age 18. So this is strictly the death of a parent or sibling. So they estimate there's about 6 million bereaved young people by age 18. And that more than doubles by age 25. We also know from some other studies, including some done by New York Life, that they estimate about 90% of young people will experience the death of a significant person in their life. So be that a relative, a friend, a teacher, someone who is important to them before the age of 20. Um, this is also from Judy's House if you're curious about the national map. Um, again, I highly recommend their website. You could see their methodology, um, how they arrive at these numbers, what sort of goes into weighing them. Um, definitely, definitely check it out. Thanks, Evelyn. Uh, and in the chat, you have the Judy's House website. <clears throat> I apologize for the noise. I think they're cutting the grass outside right now, so my apologies. But we've been talking a lot about grief, right? But what is grief? What is grief in the grand scheme of everything, right? Grief is a very multifaceted response to a loss. Um, it's a compilation of emotions, right? Um, you can feel it emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, physically, right? And it's it's very universal and it's a very natural and healthy response. I know uh, culturally in my personal culture, sometimes they want you to just push it to the side, but it's a very natural response. Um, it also enacts a series of responses that kind of help us as individuals to adapt and rebuild after a loss. And a lot of the times this grieving process is, is often really misunderstood, right? Excuse me. So we have this uh, nationwide survey by the New York Life Foundation, and it reveals to us that the majority reported that it takes as many as six years to move forward after experiencing a loss. But they also noticed that that support from family and friends, it really wanes just after three months. And I wonder, and I ask you guys, why do you think that is? If you could just type that into the chat for me. Why do you think that this support fades after three months? So while you guys are typing in the chat, <clears throat> and Evelyn will monitor that for me, I hope. <laughs> so, you know, people are showing up in the immediate time following a loss or a death, but that quickly goes away, right? And many times it's because we have our own commitments, right? We have our own priorities. Um, we might think, you know, if I keep asking about it, I'm harming them in some way because I'm bringing it up. Um, we've also heard folks say that, they just don't know what to say, right? And they don't know what to do and they don't know how to support someone who's grieving, especially a child, right? And this underscores the deep need for a place like Good Grief and, and days like Children's Grief Awareness Day, right? Because we're normalizing talking about grief, right? It's something that we all go through. Um, also in Good Grief, we have our nights of support that really enable children and their families to no longer feel alone in their grief. Yeah, I'm seeing some great responses in the chat too. You know, people go on with their lives. They think you should too. People move right. on and think you should get over it or it's too uncomfortable and threatening for others to sit with it and consider it might happen to them. Yeah, yes. The timeline that people put on grief and the false sense of understanding of the grief process. Um Oh, yeah, that's right. after the funeral services are complete, then people start to return to their regular Absolutely. schedule. Absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so it's nothing malicious. No, and we tend to see grief as this like linear process. And, and the more you get into this work and the more webinars that you take from us, <laughs> you'll learn that it, it's really not that way. It's really more of, of waves. It comes in waves. Yeah, it's, it's a lifelong nonlinear process for sure. Mm -hmm. So I think we see the need. And the fact that you're here in this webinar today learning about 
ways to honor and educate uh, around children's grief. I think you do as well. But we wanted to share some of this to really just drive home the idea that grieving children are all around us and they're receiving varying levels of support. Um, and we realize that, that that support can fade so quickly and we want to help them feel less alone. So when thinking about in your communities, and a lot of this is geared towards school communities, but I, I think it could be adapted for other places and spaces as well. Um, we wanted to talk about some of the ways that you can recognize and honor and educate for Children's Grief Awareness Day. So the first one is to wear blue. Um, so blue is the official color of Children's Grief Awareness Day. Um, on Children's Grief Awareness Day in our centers, we will all be wearing blue shirts. You, know, you can see these are schools who um, encourage the young people to wear blue and they had their signs. Um, you can also post online. Some people have never heard of Children's Grief Awareness Day or Children's Grief Awareness Month. So you can share resources from us. Um, you can also share resources from the National Alliance for Children's Grief. So we'll be sharing their toolkit um, for this entire month. So that way you'll have that um, as well. If you tag us or uh, send us a picture, we will also post it on our social media channels. So sort of boosting the message of the work that you are doing either in your homes, your communities, or your schools. We have a printable sign as well. So that will also be in the materials that we share with you. So if you want to print it and hold it up and post photos, that would be wonderful. Another thing that you can do is create a memory wall or a tree in your building where students can add memories or messages. And you could do this a few different ways. So these are some pictures from our centers. So we have a tree in our orientation room where families who come through, the young people can write a message on there. So you could do something similar. Um, you don't need to have a beautiful painted tree underneath that. Yeah, this is something that you could do anywhere with butcher block paper or a whiteboard. Uh, we have our photo wall in our centers where our participants can bring in the photos of their person who died. We also have, and I have to shout out our TC, Michelle, who created the Good Grief Postal Service in our Princeton Center, where you can write messages to your person. And there's prompts like my favorite memory or something I want to tell my person. But you could also flip the script on this one a little bit. Um, New York Life had a really awesome booth that I saw at New York Comic Con where they encouraged folks to write messages of encouragement to grieving young people. Yeah, so that could also be something that you might want to participate in. And then you could share the messages with a center like ours as well. I love that postal service. I think that is so cool. It's really cute. Michelle's so creative. Other ways that we can um, honor and educate is to use morning announcements. And in the end of this, when you get your email, you'll have um, access to that because we have a script that will make it super easy for you. We know you have a lot on your plate. Uh, you can also have a moment of reflection. You can also have your librarian or your library and media center display grief-related books. You can also have some fundraisers. I know that now we're gearing back getting away from offering food but you can have theme days you can have jeans day you can have you know wear blue to school that day or if your school allows it a bake sale of blue candy or something along those lines or blue supplies pencils erasers uh things like that that don't have any peanuts or anything in them i told you bendy pencils Bendy pencils, yes. That was the fundraiser. I bonded over bendy pencils. Our daughters love these bendy <laughs> pencils. They are not useful at all. <laughs> We've noticed you can't even write with them, but the children love it. So blue bendy <laughs> pencils, go for it. It's awesome. Yes. I feel bad for you if you have to sharpen one, but the, yes. the children love them. They do. They absolutely do. <clears throat> and what we have here is a photo of Mackenzie. And Mackenzie is a good grief kid. And she asked to do a presentation to her class about her mom. Um, and her school was incredibly supportive. You know, all the children wore blue for her. And you can see that she has her good grief shirt and her pin and a bracelet, right? Um, 
she tells her story about her mom and that's a part of how Mackenzie continues that bond with her mom, right? Because here at Good Grief, we always talk about continuing those bonds. Um, and we're so incredibly proud of her for bringing Children's Grief Awareness Day to her classroom. But that's another way that you can honor, right? You can have a child if they feel comfortable, you know, give a presentation and explain to them who their person is and how they continue their bond and showing them that, you know, they're supported through their grief. So some things that you can consider, right, and keep in mind is that we want to educate and raise awareness around children's grief, but we in no way want any child to feel singled out, right? We don't want you to go to the classroom and be like, hey, you, Evelyn, we know you lost somebody. Come up here and talk to us about it, right? We don't want that. We don't want to make them speak or make them feel like they have to be the poster child for grief, right? We want to support them and we want to support them in their way and how they need to be supported, right? Not all children want their grief publicly recognized and that's okay. Yes. We're all about following their lead. Absolutely. So some other things to keep in mind. Uh, we just want you to be aware that this could trigger some reactions, you know, no matter how much time has passed since the loss. Um, and sometimes we might not even realize that a child is grieving a loss until they have a reaction. So before planning anything for Children's Grief Awareness Day or Children's Grief Awareness Month within your school, your community, just get familiar with the resources that are available and be prepared to provide support or direct them to support if needed. It's also really important to loop in all the grownups. So that means all the school staff, the parents, the caregivers, even if they're not directly involved, you know, we don't want something to be a surprise. Absolutely, absolutely. So now we're gonna shift gears really quickly and we're gonna do a, a quick walkthrough of the activities that we're going to share with you after our session. So the first walk activity that I'm gonna walk you through is the K through second, right? No, K through fifth, K through fifth. K through five. And if you just give me a moment, I will um, share a Google Drive link yes. with everyone. So let me just get that into the chat. So what you are going to get is a link to the activities in the chat. Um, it is a Google Drive folder. Um, yes. And then I'm looking yes, in, in the chat. Yes, <laughs> Mary Beth. That. The staff as well, you know, sometimes, um, you know, schools will reach out to us after um, there's been a loss in their community. And I'm so grateful that in New Jersey, there is the Traumatic Loss Coalition who will come in and do some of that psychological first aid for everyone, you know, because it's so important. Yeah. And then Gina, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, you would be amazed at how many young people say that the person that they talk to in their building is the security guard. Mm -hmm. or the janitor, yep. or, you know, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Our, our custodians, because I think, you know, they get to interact with them in a different way than some of the other adults in the building. So and it is so important with the bus drivers, Gina, that's so true, because that's like the first thing that they see before they even get to school. Um, my daughter's one that is like BFFs with the custodian at her school. And she's like constantly talking about Mr. John, Mr. John. So I, I do know that um that is so true. They do speak to the cafeteria, the custodian, the bus drivers, sometimes more so than they do their own teachers. Mm -hmm. And it's great. It's, it, and that just shows, you know, what kind of impact adults have in the school system. So you are all extremely important. Absolutely. So um, before you move on, I have shared the link to the activities. You should see that there is a folder for the K through five and one for the six through 12. We're going to go through K through five first. I mean, you don't need these activities, but I know some of us, we love to have our paper. <laughs> so <laughs> you you have access to that. It will be shared um, via constant contact as well, um, along with some other materials from uh, Highmark the Caring Place, Printable Signs, social media campaign from NACG. We're just going to flood you with really awesome things. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> as, as a former educator myself, I love getting all kinds of resources wherever I could. So our first activity is called Inside Outside Feelings, okay? So I just want to explain the activity to you guys. And if you have any questions, um, please write in, into the chat and we will uh, try our best to answer that for you. So 
a lot of grieving children really have a hard time communicating this difficult experience that they're facing, right? And a lot of times they feel alone in schools. However, we know that they're not alone in these feelings of isolation. And we know that they're not alone in these challenges of community of communicating these difficult emotions. So in this activity, the students are really prompt to consider these difficult emotions that they're going through and how sometimes what they're feeling on the inside isn't what they're showing on the outside, right? And this experience is, is not unique just to grieving children. And this activity can be a tool that can really help you build empathy and understanding, right? So you need about 30 minutes. Uh, the materials that you're gonna have are paper plates or construction paper, right? Something simple. Markers, crayons, uh, colored pencils, or any other writing utensil that you think a child will like to utilize. So the first thing that you're gonna do is really introduce the lesson by explaining to them, you know, what Children's Grief Awareness Day is, right? Today's Children's Grief Awareness Day, and it's a day that, you know, is observed nationally, and it's to raise awareness about grieving children and to make sure that they know that we support them. And of course, you wanna um, model this or modify it for your age group, for your classroom in a way that they can understand it, right? And after you explain to them what Children's Grief Awareness Day is, you're going to go over some group agreements. Now, I understand that, you know, a kindergartner might not understand the word confidentiality, right? But you can say to them, you know what, what's shared in this room is going to stay in this room because we respect each other, right? We're going to share. We're going to use our listening ears, right? Uh, you could say we're not going to repeat what we hear in this room, right? Because this is, this is our family, however you want to explain it to them. It's also super important that you really drive home the point of the pass rule, right? Because we don't want to single anyone out. So if, you know, they pass, it's okay. Here at Good Grief, silence is honored, right? Um, we're not going to shame you. We're not going to question you. We're not going to coerce you. You're not going to be voluntold, you know, to do something. Um, but we do ask that you put away your technology. We ask that, you know, you give your attention um, and you pay attention to who's speaking to you at the moment. Another big rule that we have here is, is touching, right? We don't want to go into anyone's personal space. I know that sometimes children... Um, you know, that's my best friend and they're crying and I'm going to hug them. <laughs> but explaining to them, you know, you want to ask permission. Can I hug you? Is it OK? And, and you want to receive consent to do so. And then we'll get into our activity, right? So you're going to share with them that today's activity, um, we're going to show that each of us can experience big emotions, right? And that sometimes that, that could be a little bit hard to talk about. So you're going to ask your classroom, you know, is, is it sometimes hard or difficult to share emotions with others? You can say, why is it hard to share emotions with others? Why do you think that we hide these emotions, right? What do our faces or our body language say on the outside? And I know that that can be sometimes difficult and you might want to model it for them to kind of prompt them, you know, when I do this, how do you think I feel? And, you know, you'll have children tell you sad or, you know, upset. And you want to go into those, excuse me, that emotional language with the children. And then you're going to ask them, what are some emotions that we can name? And I'm going to ask you guys to put some in the chat. What are some emotions that you can name? And why might we feel some of these emotions, right? I feel elated when my children give me a hug. Or I feel sad when I can't go trick-or-treating or I can't go outside with them because I was sick. So if you can just put into the chat, what are some emotions that you can name? And, and why might you feel that? Guilty that it was my fault. Yes, absolutely scared and lonely. I think guilt is a big one, not just for children, but for us as well. Sad that grandma forgets my name. Sad that your person isn't here. Absolutely. Confused and angry. Yes, all of those. Absolutely. Sadness, anger, loneliness, frustration, um, sometimes even jealousy, right? I also ask that you please be mindful of the age group that you're working with, right? Because some children 
may need to be shown the feelings chart to understand. So, you know, you might want to put this up on your smart board and, and show them what happy looks like, what angry looks like. Um, in this specific one, I absolutely love this little boy here who's bored. I mean, you cannot get more perfect than that, right? Absolutely amazing. So you want to share that with them. Um, and this poster, you can purchase it on Am. Uh, do we have the link, um, Evelyn, to put it in? Yeah, the so the link is embedded in the notes of the PowerPoint. So you will have access to both of these PowerPoints within the Google Drive, which I find helpful for myself. I'm more of a visual learner. So this um, might help if you have some visual learners in your classroom communities as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And once you go through the emotions and naming them and you see that that the children really have a grasp and kind and understand what's going on, then you're going to go into the directions. And what the students will have about 10 to 15 minutes to complete this activity. And you're going to ask them to think of a time where they went through something difficult and it was hard to talk about. And then on one side of the plate, you're going to draw your face and how you felt on the inside, right? Be it sad, jealous, lonely. And then on the other side of the plate, you're going to draw a face again. But this time, you're going to show how you feel on the outside, right? So in the inside, I'm feeling sad, but on the outside, I show happiness. In the inside, I'm feeling lonely, but on the outside, I show whatever it is that they want to show. So I ask you all, think of a time where you went through something difficult. And how did you feel? And you can also use construction paper where you can um, fold it into like a trifold that will also be in your um, in your resources where they can fold the edges. And on the close side, they're going to draw their face on how they felt on the outside. And on the paper, they can draw their face again and this time show how they feel on the inside. Yes, I'll show this image again. So you can see... There's the inside and outside, the inside and outside. So they've kind of folded it in to reveal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know we're not K through five students, but just <laughs> curious thinking about for your yourselves, you know, what think about a time that you did go through something difficult and you don't have to share what it was in particular in the chat, but, um, you know, how did you feel on the inside? And then what was the face you had to put on? for the world. And I think that's that's something that's very universal, right? You hear people say, you know, put on a happy face <laughs> or make sure that, you know, you leave your emotions at the door, but we're human. We're not robots. We can't do that. That That's difficult. So it's always important for us to, at Good Grief, we always say to put our oxygen masks on first. So it's always good to kind of check in with yourself. How are you feeling? What face am I giving to the world, right? And it's important to give the children enough time to um, draw these faces, to explore these emotions, right? And then after they do that, you're going to ask them to sit with a partner and pair share, right? Share about your, your inside and your outside faces. If the students are comfortable, you know, allow them the time to share with a partner about what happened and what their feelings were. Um, and if time allows that, you, you want to let them repeat the process with another partner. You also want to make sure when they're pair sharing and you're kind of facilitating and walking around, um, you remind them, is there anything that you do not want to share? Is there anything that you do not want this person to come back into the group and, and share with everyone else? And then you're going to close out this activity. You're going to wrap it up by inviting students to share with the whole class if they want to, what they learned summarize some of the themes, right? Encourage them to support one another and to be kind to one another through, through difficult experiences, right? Because we all go through hard things and we all need each other and that's okay. You wanna also close up by thanking them for sharing and encouraging them that it's always okay to come and talk to you when they're going through something that's difficult to talk about. Now, before um, Evelyn goes with her activity, are there any questions, anything that you um, are not sure about, anything that you want us to go back to? Uh, 
Oh, I see in the chat, Evelyn, inside I felt sad and kind of blank, but outside I had to smile. I didn't want to make people feel uncomfortable. Yes, absolutely. Terrified and worried outside. Yep. Silver lined it all. <laughs> Silver lined. We made that into a verb. Absolutely, Gina, I agree. I think a lot of times um, as adults, you know, we just fake it till we make it, right? But we want to kind of get away from that and we want to feel our feelings and we want to identify them and help them through that. Well, it seems like there aren't any questions in the chat, but just know that if you do think of a question, you can hop in and you can always reach out to us um, after the webinar as well. So I'm gonna walk you through the activity that we are providing Oh, there's a question. How much time do you usually give? So that activity we recommend about 30 minutes. 30 minutes, yes. If you if you have more, you can do more pair shares and also give the young people more time for art, which can be yes. very important. Um, but we recommend at least 30 minutes to do that activity. Um, and we recommend the same amount of time for this next activity as well called Walk in My Shoes. So this is very similar. It's a parallel activity. You know, sometimes our young people, our teens, our preteens, they're having difficulty communicating the hard experiences that they're facing, how they might feel alone at school. Um, but just like we said with the younger ones, we know that they are not alone in these feelings. They are not alone in feeling isolated. Uh, they are not alone in feeling challenged and being able to communicate difficult emotions. So again, they're going to think about the difficult emotions that they can sometimes feel on the inside, but hide from others on the outside. But they are also going to take some time to think about how they want to be supported by others. So for this one, the materials that you're going to need, well, number one, you'll need 30 minutes set aside at least maybe more if you'd like to have more in-depth conversations and pair shares. Again, paper plates or construction paper. I actually think paper is better for this one and you will see why. Um, and then something to write or draw with. So just like what we do with the younger ones, we do want to let them know that we're not just doing this for no reason. You know, We wanna raise awareness around this National Awareness Day of Children's Grief Awareness Day and Children's Grief Awareness Month. And you know, why are we doing this? I think, especially when you start getting into older grades, they want to know why. Why are we doing this thing? What is in it for me? What is the purpose? So we want to make sure that we set the tone for Children's Grief Awareness Day, but also why we are doing this activity. Once again, we'll go through the group agreements. Um, we'll remind them that they only have to share what they want to share and what they feel comfortable sharing. We are big fans of doing things popcorn style here at Good Grief. So we say, if you're hot, you pop. So we always honor silence. Um, and I always say that silence does not equate disengagement. You know, we want our young people to interact with these activities in the ways that feel good and comfortable for them, in the ways that they are ready to do. So if you have a young person who really is able to do some self-reflection but is struggling maybe with verbalizing it in the larger group, that is okay. Silence does not equal disengagement um, when we are doing these activities. So you will start this lesson, this activity with a quote. You never really know a person until you understand things from their point of view, until you climb into their shoes and walk around in them. So then you'll wanna ask, you know, what does what does this mean to you? And I'll present this question to you all as well. You know, we're not in grades six through 12. We're all, I think, mostly adults here. I don't think any kids snuck on that I know of. But when you read this quote, you know, what does it bring to mind for you? You never really know a person until you understand things from their point of view, until you climb into their shoes and walk around in them. And how often do we do this? You know, how often do we take the time to sit down and consider things from another person's perspective, 
from another person's point of view, from their, the context of their whole life. Yeah, empathy, non-judgment. Absolutely. So we want to have that conversation. And then, of course, because these are kids, you know, we're not talking about literal shoes. Yeah, compassion. You all are so good. You know, we want to just make sure that they're clear that we're going to talk about imagining what it is like to go through what another person is going through, especially when they're going through big, difficult challenges. Yes, I love that open-mindedness. Everyone has a story and struggles no one knows about. I have had that reset so many times. You know, being here at Good Grief, hearing people's stories. You know, every training that we do with our volunteer facilitators, I hear stories, things that you would never even imagine, the challenges, the adversity, the deep losses. Um, and you just think, wow, everyone is walking around with these stories and we don't even know because we don't really often open that door, that invitation to these conversations. And I think that is a big part of this activity. We are creating the space and the time and the permission for the reflection and the conversation. So you'll explain to your class that each of them will be tracing their shoe on construction paper um, and completing some prompts for discussion. And I would like to suggest that you pair young people who do not sit directly next to each other or who are best friends, because we really want them to empathize with someone that they may not know very well or that they may not talk to very often. And then what they're going to do is they're going to help their partner trace their shoe. This is what I'm saying I think paper might work better because I know some of these young people you know, if you've got a size 13 <laughs> basketball shoe, it might not fit on the plate. <laughs> so, um, so you'll just want some plain construction paper or white paper, whatever it is that you have. And they're going to trace each other's shoes, which is sort of fun and funny. And then they are going to take the outline of their shoe. And inside of the shoe, they are going to write about some challenges that they faced. And how they would describe what it's like to walk around in their shoes. But then, and this is where I think it differs from the exercise with the younger students, is how would you like to be treated when you are going through something difficult? And I ask you all this question, just as adults, you don't need to pretend to be kids or anything like that. How would you like to be treated when you are going through something difficult? What is helpful and supportive to you in your world? Understood. You want acknowledgement, listening, respect and empathy? No, not sympathy. We don't want, oh, you poor thing. Just walk with me. You don't even have to say anything. There is power in presence, kindness, patience. Yeah, we want to be seen. We want to be heard. I'm hearing companioning. Yes, Kate, laughter. Sometimes you need that distraction. Connection, that's a good one. Checking in, praying for you. Hanging out without trying to solve my yes. problem. Oh my goodness. Yes. And that's a hard one. I'm sorry. If you all work with young people, then you know that temptation because you are looking at them and you can clearly see like what needs to happen and what they need to do and what the solution is. Um, but you know, if you just tell them, they might not do it. Um, and it can be very tempting to just kind of throw solutions at young people, but also sometimes even with other adults. I mean, I think we're all guilty of doing that with a friend, like, well, if you thought about this or if you tried that, and sometimes you really just want to be seen and heard. You want your emotions validated. Yeah. Hope. 
<laughs> just general hope mm -hmm. and not solutions. So, I mean, look at everything that we generated in this chat. So these young people are going to take the time to do the same and think about how do they want to be treated? And I don't know how often they've been prompted to even consider this. And I do think the self-reflection, being able to identify how you want to be treated is also the first step in being able to communicate that to other people. You have to be clear on what your wants and needs and desires for help um, or no help, you know, whatever it is that works for you when you are going through a challenging and difficult time. Because once you get clear on that, then it's easier to ask for it too, or make it clear to other people. So I think this is a useful exercise on a lot of different levels for our young people. So then once again, we are going to do a pair share when the shoes are completed. And you do want to give them some time. I'd say a good 10 to 15 minutes to write at least. So that's a big chunk of the 30 minutes. You could put on some music. I know kids are always sneaking their, um, <laughs> their AirPods and wireless headphones in, but um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of putting on some, some contemplative music and just letting them have that time. But then you're going to want to talk about what it looks like to listen well. You know, paying attention, putting down distractions, facing the other person, not interrupting, but we really want them to actively imagine what it's like to walk in the other person's shoes. And then when they're done, make sure they thank each other. They are sharing possibly very personal things with one another. Um, if you think they might need it, you could also model what um, good active listening looks like and remind your students, you know, they just did some self-reflection. They've been writing, they've been thinking. There might be parts of the story that they thought about or wrote about that they don't want to share out loud. And that's okay. Let them know that they only have to share the parts of their story that they're comfortable sharing. And it's okay if some of this reflection was really truly just for them. So then you can just put up this loose guide here. Yeah, you know, they're going to share their shoe stories. Say that three times fast, uh, <laughs> choose who will share first. And the listener will ask, how do you want others to treat you? So then you'll give them probably about one to two minutes per person and then have them swap. After both of them have shared, you'll want to prompt them just to check in. Are, are there anything or any parts of your story, anything that you just shared that you wouldn't want shared with the large group? Because the final step is a large group reflection with these older students. So then you'll invite students to find a new partner and repeat the sharing. And you can keep doing this and have them switching partners based on the amount of time that you have available. So then this is when we bring them back together. You're going to ask the students to share a few highlights of what they learned about their classmates, maybe something that they didn't know. Remind them that there might be parts of their partner story that they don't want shared in the large group. Ask if they were able to imagine what it was like to walk in the other person's shoes and how that went. And then we've got these guiding questions here. You know, what did you learn? What can you do for others? Why is this important? And then if you want, you can even write this brainstorm on the board. So you can ask them what they think they should do for others who are going through challenges, adversities, losses, you know, and just like what you all shared, they might say, show the person respect, kindness, show up, ask mm -hmm. questions, really listen when they say how they're doing, let them know that you care about them, give them a hug if they're huggers, some of us are, some of us aren't. Um, and just spending time with them and talk about why this is so important. You know, what, one of the best ways that we can overcome challenges in our lives is by having the support of people who really care about us. Um, so they can even think about a person in their life who's going through a challenging situation and think about what they could do you know, beyond this classroom exercise to do a kind act for them or show up for them. 
So just like the other lesson, you want to wrap up by just inviting any further sharing, encourage them to support one another, and of course, thank them. You know, they've done something that might be easy for some, but more difficult for others. So I just want to pause there and see, do you have any questions about this particular activity? It is on the Google Drive. Um, you'll also have this PowerPoint as well with all of the notes there. So we've really done everything for you for this lesson. Um, 30 minutes, paper, and something to write with, and you are good to have a really meaningful conversation with grades six, six through 12. I'm not seeing anything in the chat yeah. just I'm, yet. I'm doing my facilitator. Wait, just a little pause. It's okay. <laughs> if you think of something, you know, the chat doesn't close. We are here. Absolutely. So now that we've walked through these activities. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, now that we've walked through these activities, we are going to shift gears just a little bit and talk about how you can support on Children's Grief Awareness Day or any day of the year here at Good Grief. So, you know, how can you help at Good Grief? And I think one of the biggest things you can do is if you are in the state of New Jersey, or if you know a young adult who would like virtual support, refer families to us. It is completely free. Our programming is unlimited. Families come to us between September through June, every other weeknight. They get pizza, they get peer support. Um, our kids are from ages three through 30, but then we also have spousal and partner loss, child loss and caregiver groups, as well as our young adult, that young adult is virtual and in person as well. So there's no insurance involved. There's no referral. There's nothing like that. So please, uh, school communities are probably one of our largest points of referral. Um, do not hesitate to reach out. Yes, Gina. We do have some <laughs> folks that travel from PA. Thank you. Shout out to my like New Hope area <laughs> families. Um, yes, if you can easily get to Princeton or Morristown, we would love to support you or support some families that you might know. I also have to make a plug for volunteering with Good Grief. Oh, Annette's going to make a plug. For no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So volunteers really make all of this possible, right? We have amazing volunteer opportunities throughout our programs. Um, if you're interested in learning more, please either reach out to Evelyn or myself um, and we can get you connected. We have our next volunteer facilitator training coming in November for our Morristown location and in January for both Morristown and Princeton. Um, so if you've ever considered making a direct impact in the lives of children and families, I really encourage you uh, to come to our trainings and, and, and see what it's all about. In addition to that, we also have um, our Good Grief Schools. So we provide a fee-for-service virtual training, and we equip schools to deliver grief support uh, groups and resilience-focused social and emotional learning. Uh, you can go to our website. Uh, you can reach out to us to learn more about how to bring these programs to your schools. Um, you can go to goodgriefschools.org. We can drop that into the chat if you'd like. Mm -hmm. And I just want to answer a few things. I was trying to type and I'm just a faster speaker than typer. <laughs> so the only program that we have virtually currently is our young adult group. So up to age 30, you can receive support via Zoom. Um, we do not have groups for kids who are dealing with elders experiencing dementia, although I would say that um, local hospice is probably your best bet for finding support groups that might be able to accommodate that community. Um, we don't currently have virtual volunteering opportunities, but if you are at a distance or maybe facilitating is not your thing, you know, we do have other opportunities that you can bring your skills. So whether you're a greeter, handing out pizza, if you are a fundraiser or a razor's edge whiz, or you, you know, you do um, social media or, you know, really, really anything that that might be helpful. We have found ways to utilize folks' skills. Um, we do have some high school teens that have been trained as volunteers I think we've gone as young as 17, but um, if there's any NOS program folks, you can double check me 
on that. Um, the support is uh, the young adult groups are offered virtually and they can be anywhere. Our centers, they don't have to be in New Jersey even or in a particular county and they can come and join our in-person groups. Oh, and I see Kim answered. Yes, we do accept teen volunteers. Um, oh, thank you, Lisa. Alzheimer's associations are good for families dealing with dementia. You all are just a wealth of information for young enough for one another. Oh, thank you, Gina. Yes, we have mature middle school students being pizza greeters with a uh, with a parent. So there's lots of ways to get involved. We also have events um, that we always need volunteers for. We have our 5K, we have our gala, you know, we do all this funding to continue our free and unlimited peer support to continue to bring free webinars and resources. Um, this also includes Giving Tuesday. So uh, Children's Grief Awareness Day is the week before Thanksgiving and then Giving Tuesday kicks up um, after Thanksgiving. So um, thinking about all of that end of year goodness and giving and supporting your favorite local charities. Um, I do want to share this. So next month, our free webinar will be um, about supporting LGBTQ grief. It is with Jamie Thrower. Um, oh, Kate, the gala usually happens in October. We just had one. Um, uh, so it should be happening next October. And I believe next year it's happening in the Princeton area for the very first time. So woo -woo, Princeton. Uh, so our um, understanding LGBTQ grief and cultivating inclusive support with Jamie Thrower of Queer Grief Club. It's going to be really wonderful. Um, that is the link that you would use to register. I have a few other things that I want to share with you all. Um, I have the full, so I had just shared the folder with the activities you will get this folder as well in the follow-up email from us. This is the full Children's Grief Awareness Day toolkit. It has flyers from Highmark the Caring Place. It has printable signs. It has the activities that we just went through. It has um, the social media toolkit from the National Alliance for Children's Grief. It is truly a one-stop shop for everything that you might need. And included there is also the script that we talked about earlier if you wanted to do um, announcements. Uh, I believe we also have letters um, to parents and educators, if I'm not mistaken. So it really is, Evelyn is not joking when she says it is a one, one stop shop. Yeah. So before we let you go, um, you know, similar to the waterfall activity that we did in the beginning, I want you to think of one idea that you're taking with you or one word to describe how you're feeling at the end of this session. Um, so when I say go, please, please, please give us the same waterfall that we had in the beginning. Okay. Uh, ready? Get set and go. Encouraged. Inspired. Thank you, Lisa. empowered, supported, excited. Oh, that makes my heart so happy. Oh, wonderful. Motivated, absolutely peaceful, knowledgeable. Well, you all have been wonderful. We would love to get your feedback on today and also on the materials. So I will share a survey in the follow-up email, but I'll also put it in the chat. So if you wanna let us know your experience of today. If you have any ideas for future webinars, you know, we really do um, take your wants and needs into account. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We appreciate your time um, and your engagement. And we hope that you are able to utilize these in your communities. And please, if you ever have any questions, uh, reach out. I am Evelyn with two N's at good-grief.org. <laughs> um, and in, Annette is also available to answer questions as well. So I'm going to- I also have two ones. <laughs> yes, feel free. You could, you could type it in the chat there so they can actually find us directly. Um, 
please. Let's let's all stay in touch. Yes. Yes. I you have will... a question if the recording, you will get a link for the recording. Is that correct, Evelyn? It's yes. on our YouTube uh page. Let me let me press pause because I feel like I'm recording. <laughs> <laughs> Things we don't need. Uh, all right. So let's